Good morning, and um, thank you so much to Caroline, Tim Ross and Biddy, and whoever else was involved in inviting me to come and speak with you uh, this morning. Um, and also to Kristin for making sure I got here safely. That was much appreciated. Um, I'm honestly really excited about the healthy campus movement in Ireland, and that's, um, that's coming from um, the UK where I sort of was at the helm of the movement for many years. But we've never got to anywhere near the point of having the level of leadership and commitment you've got across government departments. So I think that is something to be really celebrated. Um, and, and so it's great just to be able to be here to, to kind of celebrate and share some of those experiences of the journeys that you're all on. So in this session, um, I'll start by outlining the context for and history of healthy campuses, elsewhere called healthy universities or health promoting universities and colleges. I'll discuss theory and practice. I'll pro provide an overview of the global movement and give some personal insights drawn from my experience of working locally, nationally and internationally. And I'll end by setting out some challenges that I think are also opportunities for higher education institutions and offering some reflections on the role of government going forward. So to set the scene, universities occupy an increasingly important place in society. Globally, it's estimated that by 2040, there'll be 594 million university students, a rapid increase since the turn of the millennium. And I think in considering healthy campuses, it's important for us to ask the question, what are universities for? And over centuries, there have been contrasting narratives, universities as communities of learning and development, as sources of expertise and vocational identity, as sites for the generation and evaluation of new knowledge, and as important contributors to and shapers of society. Um, the Royal Irish Academy Higher Education Futures Task Force suggests that Ireland's HEIs will be open, transformative, transnational, regionally rooted, deeply networked, sustainable, diverse, engaged and discernibly Irish, with their principal purposes being to empower citizens of diverse ages and backgrounds to become lifelong learners, to create and apply knowledge through research and learning guided by the UN Sustainable Development Goals and the EU Green Deal, and to advance society and share expertise to foster an ecologically sustainable, inclusive, diverse, just and economically successful island. The task force also included a quote from the President of Ireland, um, which powerfully advocates the role of universities in relation to wider society. Universities are both a part from and a part of society. They are a part in the sense that they provide a critically important space for grasping the world as it is, and importantly, for reimagining the world as it ought to be. But universities are also a part of our societies. What's the point unless the accumulated knowledge, insight and vision are put at the service of the community? With the privilege to pursue knowledge comes the civic responsibility to engage and put that knowledge to work in the service of humanity. Um, the roots of the healthy campus approach um, can be traced back to the 1986 Ottawa Charter for Health Promotion, which suggested that health is created and lived by people within the settings of their everyday lives where they le learn, work, play and love. And I think it's that assertion that launched what became known as the Healthy Settings Movement, at which healthy campuses are now one important application. Unlike many other settings programs, the Healthy Campus Movement has received limited global leadership from WHO and has largely had to plough its own furrow. And as you can see from this timeline, the movement has developed over more than 25 years, kick-started in the mid-1990s when two UK universities established pilot projects. Other key milestones have included the seminal 1998 book on health promoting universities, the establishment of national and regional networks, and the 2015 International Conference and resulting Okanagan Charter. Having looked at the context and history, um, I'll now focus a little bit on theory and how that relates to practice. 
And I know some of you might have seen this slide in a presentation I gave a couple of years ago. Um, it's borrowed from my colleague, Matt Dolph, um, at the University of British Columbia with a quote, if the frogs in a pond behave strangely, our first reaction would not be to punish them or treat them. Instinctively, we'd wonder what was going on in the pond. And for me, that engagingly explains what the healthy settings approach is about. It's, it's, its focus is not primarily about medical treatment or individual behavior change and what often becomes victim blaming, but rather how can we modify the contexts and environments in which people live and make choices so that they actively support well-being. I've argued um, in publications that the healthy settings approach is underpinned by core public health values such as equity, partnership, and participation and empowerment, and has five overarching characteristics. First, it represents a shift to what's known as a salutogenic view, concerned not only with illness, but with well-being and what makes people thrive and flourish. And the term salutogenesis, which is from the Latin and Greek, literally means the origins of health. And in this context, it means fostering health potentials that are inherent in everyday settings. Second, it adopts an ecological model. It appreciates that health is holistic and dynamic, multi-layered and determined by a complex interaction of personal, social, behavioral and environmental factors. It focuses on populations within particular contexts and it addresses human health within the framework of ecosystem health. Third, it views settings as dynamic complex systems, acknowledging interconnectedness and synergy between different components and recognizing that each setting is connected to the world around it. In the context of higher education, I suggest that the settings approach can add value through a focus on people, place, and increasingly planet and the interrelationships between them. Understanding the university campus as a context that directly and indirectly impacts well-being through creating healthy and supportive learning, working and living environments. Integrating health into the institution's culture and core business of learning and teaching, research and societal engagement and connecting with and contributing to the well-being and resilience of the wider community. And in turn, I think we know that a commitment to an investment in health and well-being can impact positively on key priorities and enablers such as achievement, performance, productivity and reputation. Um, that conceptualization has been further developed through a more recent framing from a, a research project that we carried out on leadership this similarly emphasizes the importance of a culture and ethos that's infused with and enhances health and well-being, of breaking down silos and embedding health into and knitting together all aspects of the university's mission and activities, and of focusing on and promoting the interlinked health, well-being and connectedness of the whole population, students, staff and wider community. It's important to appreciate though that universities are large, complex and distinctive organisations with multiple purposes. If we are to advocate for healthy campus in terms of that core business, we must consider what this means and what the entry and leverage points are. Monica Suarez Reyes um, conducted a PhD in this area and she highlighted that this means understanding the cultural specificities that influence the context of a particular HEI and recognising that different factors such as senior level support, meaningful participation mechanisms, cross university and cross sector collaboration structures and a commitment to resourcing dedicated coordination and making wider funding available will all influence what is possible and what is not possible at any point in time and how successful implementation of the healthy campus concept is likely to be. Oh, it seemed to have a life of its own for a minute there. Um, furthermore, I think effective implementation can be helped by reflecting on the position that universities occupy in what can be termed the ecosystem of settings, illustrated here by this jigsaw diagram, which shows how HEIs function within the context of place. Place-based settings or healthy places represent a priority focus area 
within the Healthy Island Strategic Action Plan. And it's important to note that while campuses are highlighted alongside schools, homes, communities and workplaces, they are themselves settings that form part of the wider educational system and pathway. Communities that can in many ways be viewed as a city within a city, often large multi-component settings that operate in and contribute as key anchor institutions in the wider context of municipalities and places. Hosts for clubs, encouraging participation in both competitive sport and fit wider physical activity. <coughs> Workplaces for multiple academic and non-academic staff. Training grounds preparing students for employment and wide-ranging roles in society. And we also know, I think, that the university population comprises the diversity of people who move in and out of multiple settings in their daily lives, making it really important to understand those interrelationships. And furthermore, we know that transitions into and out of university and indeed through university can be of particular importance. Times when students are at their most vulnerable, but specifically in terms of mental well-being. Historically, universities have served as settings for delivering projects on specific priority health issues and as vehicles for teaching and researching health promotion. However, there's been growing interest in ensuring a more holistic approach to thematic work and developing more strategic and cross-cutting health promoting campus programmes. As your Healthy Campus Charter and Framework document makes clear, while research is still limited, there is a growing evidence base drawn from the education sector to, to suggest that complex, comprehensive, multi-component whole system approaches are more likely to result in positive outcomes for students, staff and the organisation as a whole. As these quotes from three contrasting research projects illustrate. This commitment to a whole university and whole system perspective is reflected and encapsulated in the influential Okanagan Charter. The culmination of the 2015 International Conference organised by the University of British Columbia this sets out a bold and inspiring vision of healthy campuses and colleges transforming the health and sustainability of our current and future societies, strengthening communities and contributing to the well-being of people, places and the planet. The Okanagan Charter was published in the same year as the Sustainable Development Goals and its strong focus on connecting health, sustainability, human rights, inclusion and compassion reflects the discussions that were taking place then and have accelerated since. Challenges such as climate change, biodiversity loss and habitat destruction are no longer viewed solely as environmental concerns, but also as concerns that are already having profound impacts on human health and social and economic justice. As the 2016 Shanghai Declaration noted, people's health can no longer be separated from the health of the planet. And I suggest that we need to take that thinking into our work on healthy campuses, adapting and applying relevant tools such as Kate Raworth's Donut Economics and building on the momentum gathering pace globally to reap the benefits of focusing on that intersection of health, justice, sustainability and climate action. The Okanagan Charter issued two calls to action. The first of which is to embed health into all aspects of campus culture across the administration, operations and academic mandates. And as you can see, this call effectively reworks the five focus areas of the Ottawa Charter and applies them to the university setting through a whole institution approach. The second call locates this whole institution perspective within a wider focus on the whole system. It's concerned to enhance health promotion research to position the university as a leader and advocate for local and global action and to embed health, wellbeing and sustainability in multiple disciplines so that students, whether studying public health, nursing, tourism, architecture or urban planning, gain a critical understanding and become equipped to be change agents in families, communities, workplaces, policy making and society as a whole. I think it's crucial that healthy campuses focuses not only internally 
and on the time that students undertake their studies, but also looks outwards and beyond on the values, understandings and priorities they take into their wider and future lives and roles. Exploring this whole system perspective, this model, which I first developed some 20 years ago, illustrates the balances involved in implementing a healthy settings approach, holding a number of aspects in tension, identifying gaps and addressing needs, but also mapping good practice and celebrating and building on strengths and capabilities, investing in long-term behind the scenes organization development to achieve whole system change while retaining a high profile through managing innovative and visible projects, securing top-down leadership alongside bottom-up empowerment and rule-based ownership, and anticipating and responding to health promotion concerns, whilst also being driven by and contributing to core higher education priorities. A further model illustrates what it means to view the university as a system and to connect between different parts of the whole a whole campus ap ap approach will mean appreciating, mapping and developing linkages between different groups of people, between different topics or issues, between different elements of the system, and between different policies. Having looked a little bit at, at theory and um, how it relates to practice, I'll now pan out to give you a sense of the global scope of healthy campuses worldwide and reflect on my experience over the years to share some insights. Following the 2015 conference held in Canada, the International Health Promoting Campuses Network was set up to inspire and catalyse action to advance the Okanagan Charter. This is guided by a steering group of which I was chair and then co-chair before retiring last year and it brings together representatives from national and regional networks across the world. And as you can see from this slide, there are currently around 15 networks involved globally, including your own. And to give a few examples, the Canadian network was set up in 2016 and currently has more than 30 institutions as members. It's strongly guided by the Okanagan Charter and has issued a statement of adoption and endorsement for campuses wanting to join. The New Zealand network has around 30 members and focuses on creating resilient, thriving, healthy students and staff. It's produced a practical guide to help universities implement the Okanagan Charter within the cultural context of their country. The Ibero-American network has more than 160 member universities across 21 countries and facilitates health promotion. Looking back, my, my involvement began um, when I was appointed to a two-year temporary post at UCLan back in 1995, um, which gives you a clue as to how old I am. Um, and and I, that was a role that was, that was part lecturer in health promotion and, and part a, a new role of setting up a health promoting university initiative that nobody really knew what, what that was meant to be or what it would look like. And 29 years on, that, that initiative is still going fairly, fairly strongly, albeit without a coordinator at the moment because um, She's currently just moved on to a new role. Looking back at my time at the university and the journey we've taken, I thought it might be useful just to highlight a few key learning points. First, it's been important to stay alert to ever-changing internal and external contexts. Horizon scanning so that we're well-placed both to preempt and prepare for new challenges and take advantage of windows of opportunity that may only open for short periods of time. Second, I think it can be really difficult to communicate what the healthy campus is, with people often thinking of it as a project. Interesting, but somehow discreet and definitely someone else's responsibility. We need to find opportunities to move beyond that constrained view, engaging people in ways that enable them to appreciate what it means to take a whole institution approach that brings health and well-being perspectives into the mainstream and connects multiple areas of work, multiple stakeholders and multiple parts of the university system. 
Third, it's been crucial to have a dedicated healthy campus coordinator to connect across the institution, provide public health expertise and drive the programme forward in a coherent and evidence-informed way. Uh, I was just talking with some people before the conference began today about, I think three years into my role, my, my head of school who didn't really understand what I was meant to be doing, um, said, surely we don't need a coordinator anymore because the healthy university is set up and you know, it seems to be going strong. And I just kind of had to communicate that actually it was just gonna fall apart because something that is as wide, as wide ranging and as complex as a, as a whole campus and a whole system approach means that you need to nurture that journey and you need to constantly have someone seeing, standing back, seeing the whole and bringing those bits together. Um, I think it's also really difficult even if you get the resources to appoint a coordinator, to know where best to locate them. Um, because that role of necessity spans the whole organisation, so it doesn't fit neatly within student wellbeing, it doesn't fit neatly within human resources, it doesn't fit neatly within estates management. Actually, it needs to be in all those places. So there's no right answer. I mean, ours was, got, ours was led over many years from a... Um, from academic public health. But um, certainly going forward, the discussions we've had have been, have been urging that role to be located within a strategic planning division, but with a strong link into academic public health so that there's that kind of robust, evidence-informed perspective. But as I say, there's no right answer to that question. I think it's about institutions finding what's right for them and where there's, there, there's that support and momentum. Um, I think fourth, there can be tensions between a university's focus on communications and marketing linked to reputation and effective health promotion. The former, in my experience, often means a degree of airbrushing, while the latter means conducting a transparent assessment of strengths and needs, but also looking upstream to identify determinants of health, which in the university context may mean focusing on things that are uncomfortable such as management style, organisational culture, financial strategy and attitudes to student activism. Oh, sorry. Fifth, I think it's been essential to build good relationships with individuals across the university system who understand and are committed to championing healthy campuses. Most obviously this involves top-down lead senior leadership, but more widely it involves bottom-up engagement of students and staff appreciating that leadership is explicitly or implicitly distributed, with people at different levels having influence and leverage. While challenging, it's also rewarding to bring together multiple diverse stakeholders and engage them in a cohesive and purposeful way. And sixth, and closely related to that last point, we need always to recognise that individuals may move on, either within or out of the university, and that means that we need to balance that focus on fostering strong interpersonal relationships with people who kind of get it and are prepared to, to lead uh, with embedding that commitment within corporate planning and strategy. Our university's senior leadership has changed significantly over recent years and a new strategic plan has been developed. We've worked really hard to build those new relationships and ensure that that plan includes a strong commitment to sustainability and to the health and well-being of student staff and local communities. And we're really pleased with the strength and ambition of the statements and the explicit reference to the Okanagan Charter to healthy universities and to UCLan's leadership role. That said, amidst organisational restructures and really challenging uh, financial times, it's been enormously difficult to keep the healthy university high up on the leadership's agenda. Uh, which I think only goes to illustrate how, you know, you know, an institution that in many ways across the world has been viewed as a, as a kind of leading light in this field um, can still have a really bumpy journey that isn't just about moving forward, it's about sometimes seeming to go backwards. As I said earlier, I'm really excited about what's happening in Ireland. Having been at the helm of the UK Healthy Universities Network and the International Health Promoting Campus Network over many years, 
I know how unusual it is to have the commitment you have from your government. And healthy campuses, with, with healthy campuses explicit in your Healthy Island strategy and with a charter and framework embedded in the HEA, drawing on the Okanagan Charter to set out what it means to take a whole system approach, and with a full-time coordinator funded to support the network and drive the movement forward. It's also really encouraging to see that the HEA has commissioned the development of an evaluation toolkit to support the implementation of the Healthy Campus Charter and Framework, and to see Trinity College Dublin, Munster Technological University, University College Cork, and the University of Limerick working actively in collaboration to take that forward. I've been really privileged to be a consultant to the development team, and I congratulate Catherine and, and Kay and David and colleagues on the fantastic work they've done. Um, I'm, I'm, I think the inclusion of a self-evaluation tool offers real opportunities to engage key actors from multiple parts of the university system. Certainly in the UK, we found that our network self-review tool proved valuable not only for internal benchmarking, but also as a powerful catalyst to bring people together across boundaries and strengthen and understand a whole campus approach. Alongside this, as Caroline alluded to, it's great to see the University of Limerick having been selected to host the 2025 International Healthy Campus Conference. And that will involve the participatory refresh and renewal of the Okanagan Charter. And I know there are already many people from campuses across the globe excited at the prospect of coming to Ireland to hear about the work and learn from the work you're doing here. Looking to the future, I want to set out some challenges for HEIs that I think also have that potential to be opportunities. First, COVID-19 made it really clear that an effective response required us to think and work holistically across the whole institution and as part of the wider whole system of the communities in which our universities are located. I think a challenge that we can usefully translate into an opportunity when advocating the healthy campus approach. COVID also highlighted that people and their health are essentially holistic, something that should come as no surprise given the shared roots of the word whole and health in both English and Gaelic. As a communicable disease caused by a virus, COVID affects physical health, but the disease and responses to it has significantly impacted mental well-being. These effects are in turn mediated by social well-being, the impacts of containment measures strongly influencing patterns of interaction and connectivity. And the pandemic also prompted what many to explore more deeply what can be termed spiritual health and to connect with the environment around us. It's likely zoonotic origins have further heightened awareness of the interdependence between the health of people and the environment and of the importance of respecting and working in harmony with the earth, with lockdowns offering glimpses of what a new and different world might look like and what it might mean to build back better. Second, this shift towards a holistic and systemic model of working makes it enormously challenging to build evidence of effectiveness. It's much easier to evaluate a discrete health promotion intervention than to capture the added value of a whole system healthy campus programme, comprising as it does multiple interconnected activities and components in the context of long-term organisation development and culture change. However, there is an emerging evidence space and we have seen a commitment to whole institution and whole system thinking gradually permeate the strategies and plans of the higher education and health sectors. Furthermore, I think universities and colleges are well placed to seize the opportunities to develop collaborative evaluative research and to engage with real world complexity, drawing on approaches such as realist evaluation and theories of change to build a robust and persuasive evidence base. As I've said, I think it's great that Trinity College Dublin partners have been awarded the evaluation toolkit tender and I'm really excited to see that rolled out, finalised and rolled out across the network because I also think that that could lead on to further research opportunities across institutions. 
Third, even if we understand the importance of holism, we may still struggle with the real world challenges involved in taking a concept as complex of healthy campuses and translating rhetoric into effective action. However, I'd urge you to hold on to that big vision, even if it might seem that you're only taking small incremental steps on the journey. For some institutions, that might mean focusing on a few thematic areas at first. For others, it might mean starting off working with one or more departments or services. I think if we're to move beyond delivering fragmented health promotion interventions to instead implement and reap the opportunities offered by a truly whole, system, whole campus approach, then we need to break down silos and work systemically. Fourth, it's really challenging to combine leadership that balances an inward focus on the health of students and staff with an outward focus on the university's wider role in generating societal well-being. Returning to the quote from the President of Ireland that I alluded to, it's clear that universities are both apart from and a part of society. And they, they play a crucial role in reimagining the world as it ought to be but they have a very crucial civic responsibility to engage with society and apply learning. This echoes the renewed focus in the UK on the idea of the civic university, with the institutions taking opportunities to strengthen engagement with communities and communicate a compelling narrative about their societal value within the context of place. It also echoes calls for a focus on global citizenship, recognising that AHEI's function within the context of converging and intensifying challenges, such as climate change, resource depletion, and social, economic, and ecological injustice. I think as a sector, higher education has a potentially powerful leadership role, not only through promoting the health of its community in the present moment, but also by practicing meaningful corporate responsibility and advocating for transformative change that will promote well-being societies. Importantly too, as I mentioned earlier, I think we need to take a long-term view that looks beyond as well as outside the institution. And I think we can lead in that way too, where we're actually about harnessing that leadership potential of our students, developing them and indeed staff as active citizens and future leaders, decision makers and influencers, able to advocate and mediate for human and planetary health. Fifth, it's been challenging to respond effectively to the problems that permeate our university communities, whilst retaining a salutogenic focus that moves beyond prevention and aspires to promote and enable well-being and thriving. Um, I'll just use two examples to illustrate this. First, in the UK, we've experienced rapidly increased concern about mental ill health among students, with almost daily media stories about a mental health crisis. I think while this has put health high up on the agenda of decision makers in higher education, responses have not surprisingly tended to focus on early intervention, crisis management, and enhanced provision of counselling and other services. Consequently, many institutions have struggled to find the space or resource to focus on prevention and the wider promotion of holistic health and wellbeing that inevitably require us to invest in healthy campuses, looking upstream harnessing contributions that may not be explicitly labelled health and seeking to address the connections between physical, mental, spiritual and social domains. Second, the climate emergency has importantly directed attention on carbon reduction and the pursuit of net zero, a focus that reflects the traditional environmental management <coughs> approach taken by universities and many other sectors with a concern to reduce the negatives. By bringing together the common perspectives that flow from a commitment to salutogenesis and I think what can be termed regenerative or restorative sustainability, I think we can raise our aspirations so that our strategic plans, campus design, operational management, research focus and curricular orientation simultaneously promote the positive well-being and thriving of both people and the earth that sustains us. This leads on to a sixth challenge which brings us full circle to revisit the concept of holism, 
with a concern to strengthen the connections between healthy campuses and other agendas such as sustainable development, diversity and inclusion, and social and environmental justice. And this means joining up to move from multiple, often disconnected programmes to a more cohesive approach, identifying thematic areas that span silos in an integrated way. For example, developing a green, active and affordable travel plan and putting in place a healthy, safe and sustainable food procurement policy. It will also mean reflecting on the dialogue taking place in wider society, such as WHO's call for an equitable economy that serves human development within planetary boundaries. And the final challenge is for us to activate and energise ourselves and colleagues so that we and they move beyond seeing the pursuit of healthy campuses as someone else's responsibility and seize the moment to use our multiple roles to translate those challenges into opportunities. And that's not to say that each of us carry the weight of what needs to be done on our own. We'll need to continually engage others at multiple levels across our campuses and work together to lead and implement whole institution change. So having set out some challenges for, for HEIs, before closing, I hope it's not pre too presumptuous for me to offer a few final reflections on the role of wider government going forward. I think a key role for the HEA, for, is it, def is it DEFERIS, if I'm, am I saying that right? DEFERIS and DOH is to take every opportunity to collaboratively champion the healthy campus model as a core setting within Healthy Island's pursuit of healthy places, as an essential and evidence-informed approach to promoting holistic health, well-being and sustainability, and to enhancing stu student success and the core missions of higher education. Championing will involve using within and across government the th all three of the Ottawa Charter strategies of advocacy, mediation and enablement to ensure that the Healthy Campus Charter and Framework are implemented across the country and supported by evaluative research to generate further evidence of effectiveness. It will also be important to align healthy campuses with other government priorities and policies. It's really promising that the framework is already visible within the Healthy Island Strategic Action Plan and the HEA's Corporate Strategic Plan. But my sense from talking with colleagues in the network is that they'd really value guidance on aligning this with other key frameworks, for example, on mental health, sexual violence, equality, diversity, inclusion, and education for sustainable development. Also, my experience of working in the fields of healthy settings and health in all policies over many years has been that even when health is explicitly mentioned within different sectors' high-level documents, something that's absolutely crucial, there can still be a way to go to achieve real integration and secure a deep-rooted understanding of how well-being is actually interwoven with the core business of those sectors. For example, in the UK, the Healthy Schools movement gained much more leverage and momentum when evidence began to emerge about how the programme impacted not just on health, but on educational achievement. And in the HEA, I, I, I know from what was said earlier and from looking online that how the Healthy Campus is located within the policy and strategic planning section linked to um, teaching and learning and student success. So I, I guess a key kind of question would be, to what extent is the healthy campus model beginning to influence the wider teaching and learning and student success strategies? And how can the HEA actively facilitate HEIs to embed health and well-being into the wider curricula of multiple disciplines? Something that it's very easy to kind of put a line in a document but it's really, really resource intensive and difficult to do. My third reflection is perhaps more controversial, that meaningful healthy campus engagement and action can be best accelerated by issuing some, some, some form of mandate. As I've mentioned, the narrative of a mental health crisis among students has in the UK and many countries put mental health high up on the agenda of decision makers but unintentionally sidelined the wider promotion of holistic health and well-being. This focus has led to ministerial calls that have in effect mandated all higher education providers to sign up to the Student Mental Health Charter, with the calls being clearly linked to student suicide. 
So having included the implementation of the Healthy Campus Charter and Framework within the HEA's Corporate Strategic Plan and Healthy Island, I'd really urge uh, government departments to work together to make sure that that broad approach is mandated or at least clearly incentivised so that there is visible high-level leadership in HEIs with the healthy campus being aligned with and articulated as the appropriate context for implementing more specific work linked to the National Student Mental Health and Suicide Prevention Framework. A further task is to support HEIs not only to implement the Healthy Campus Charter and Framework, to pro but to progress and move forward. And I think that requires a finely tuned sort of balancing act, really, between nurturing institutions, supporting them, and understanding why there might be caution and when things get put on hold because of competing priorities, but at the same time stretching them to go further. And, and indeed, that might be, as, as Biddy mentioned, for, for more to engage and, and recognising that there, there is some inequality to, to, in, in terms of the pattern of engagement and the pattern of resources be, being allocated within those institutions. Um, and I think the evaluation toolkit that I, that I mentioned earlier and that you'll hear more from Catherine later, I think it offers a powerful means to help achieve that balance because it recognises not only that the entry points and catalysts for different institutions will vary and that their journeys will be individual and often bumpy, but also that by using the self-evaluation tool for internal benchmarking over time and drawing on the repository to access shared good practice, it's possible to set realistic but ambitious goals and secure meaningful progress. Another reflection is that it might be necessary to upset a few apple carts along the way and cause some disquiet. Mandating HEIs is rarely popular because there's a strong culture of autonomy, but we know that it's often regulation that's achieved the biggest shifts in public health. In the UK, and I'm sure many other countries, there's a strong tendency to equate health promotion with individual responsibility and self-help. The healthy settings approach, however, emphasises that individual and community action must be underpinned and supported by wider cross-sector policy, organisation development and advocacy for change. Consequently, as I said earlier, the promotion of health and wellbeing being should quite legitimately focus on areas that may be uncomfortable or be seen to be out with the remit of health. For example, management style, ethical financial investments, the housing crisis, work-life balance, job security, and student finance. And finally, but really importantly, I'd urge you to focus on how you can sustain healthy campuses as a long-term cross-departmental government commitment. Healthy campuses is a journey not a destination, and embedding a commitment to health, well-being and sustainability in ways that achieve a change in culture that infuse the ethos and living, learning and working environments of universities takes time and requires continuing nurture, support, drive and resourcing. This means retaining the visibility of healthy campuses within Healthy Island and the HEA's corporate strategic plan, working to make it visible in wider policy Ensuring that tangible outputs such as a self-evaluation tool and repository are seen as dynamic rather than static, with a commitment to maintain, sustain and evaluate and further develop them over time. Articulating an, expiring, an inspiring vision into the future and working with institutions to help them turn engagement into properly coordinated and resourced programmes. To conclude, I've outlined the context and history of healthy campuses. I've explored theory and practice, given a global picture of the movement and shared some of my own experiences and insights, and ended by articulated, articulating some challenges and opportunities for universities and reflecting on the role of government going forward. As I've already said, I think the way in which Ireland is engaging and activating healthy campuses is hugely encouraging, and I, and I feel privileged to be part of the discussions and celebrations. Looking ahead to the international conference being held at the University of Limerick next year, I thought it's appropriate to leave you with these words from the Okanagan Charter, which I think still 
very clearly set out the vision and challenge that we face in mobilising for the future well-being of people, place and planet. Thank you.